Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. Today on the podcast, we have Stephanie Muscat, who owns Compassion in Caregiving, and I'm going to let her tell you more about herself because what she does is, I think, heaven's work. I think that she is so, the work that she does is so important. And when I've been in situations that where I was caring for loved ones, I sure wish I had someone like Stephanie around. So Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. You're very sweet. Thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you very much for having me. Yes. So my name is Stephanie Muscat. As you said, I am a registered social worker and I have my master of social work from the University of Toronto. I am a licensed psychotherapist, but I do so much more than that. And I now have a all-encompassing mental health network called Compassion and Caregiving. So what we do is we focus on the mental health needs of all caregivers, family and friend caregivers. If you're caring for a loved one, we hope to have something that supports you. Our main focus is one-on-one psychotherapy, which we do in Ontario. And we also have group support programs that we offer all over the world. And that's a six-week group support program. If you're not in Ontario and you want to relate to other people who are going through similar situations, and we have a lot of different things throughout our social media platforms and a podcast, which we're going to have you on soon, which I'm very excited about. And that's called Caregiver's Compass. I started this company because I myself was a primary caregiver for my mom in my early 20s. And I was going through school and can relate to you, Adrian, and a lot, probably a lot of, of your listeners and people who are connected with you in that I was going through grad school, doing my master of social work, and my mom was not well, and my grandmother was in the hospital, and I just felt like the world fell on my head. And I couldn't access supports. There was nothing out there for me as a caregiver, especially a young caregiver. So I started this to try and fill in those gaps and fill in that void. And outside of that, I'm an inpatient acute care social worker. So that's me. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for for providing that. And yes, I'm so excited to join you on your podcast as well. So for anyone listening, you will hear about it. Have no fear. And so I want to take a step back and talk about the more like nuanced experience that you had of coming to this place. Because I'm sure that, you know, when you were in undergrad before your master's, you didn't anticipate running a business and really filling this void that is so needed, that is so needed. And I not only know that it's needed from my personal experience caring for loved ones and having to deal with the dynamics between family members and caregivers, many caregivers, and also doing my master's. Like I think you and I actually have some alignment in our timelines of when we were doing the some of the care work. And and so how that actually happened for you, and I'm sure that we're going to get, you know, much deeper as the conversation goes on. I think it was many years in the work. I definitely noticed that gap when I was taking care of my mom in the beginning. And I tried to access support groups because that was the only thing I knew at the time. I in And this was starting in undergrad. I was trying to access support groups. My mom started exhibiting different symptoms and we didn't know what was going on. It was a very long time to her diagnosis up until my almost grad school was her diagnosis. 
And so I tried accessing support groups through the Alzheimer's Association. My mom has end stage dementia. So I went through the Alzheimer's Association because it was the, it was the only thing I knew. And when I was there, I was introduced to a group of ladies. And when I first walked in the room, all I saw were 80 year old women whose, you know, partners had dementia or they had, you know, an aunt that they were taking care of somebody but they were not in a relatable place to me at all. And I was met with so much shock and almost pity, like they felt bad for me. And that made me feel even more isolated and alone from where I had been before. And it wasn't their fault, obviously, but that was what I was finding. And I couldn't find anything for someone my age. There was nothing specialized for me. Once I got my master's degree and I started working in the hospital, I started encountering more and more caregivers of all ages dealing with that struggle. I can't find something. I can't find a specialized therapist. Do you know someone? Do you do this? What do I do when we're discharged from the hospital? What supports do I seek? Can I call you again? And I said, I'm, I unfortunately, no, right? Our time is very limited to when you're here. I cannot provide you with support when you leave. And it left me feeling very upset and uncomfortable and not knowing where to send these people. Or they would reach out to hospitals in their area and say, I want to join a group. And they get a wait list of two years. And so that's what people were finding. And during COVID, I was on maternity leave with my second baby and I was about to go back to the hospital and I was speaking to colleagues and the caregivers, loved ones couldn't even enter the doors of the hospital. So now they're faced with an extra layer of stress and an extra barrier. And that was when I said, OK, no, this I can't this can't happen anymore. I have the power to change this. I've been there. I know what it's like and I'm going to change this. And so I came up with this idea. And I came up with this specialized concept in the name. And I just said, oh, I'm going to run with it. And we're going to see what happens. And that's really where it came from. And and so now can we have an idea of exactly, you know, exactly more or less who it is that you're supporting? So I support a very large variety of people. But if we're looking at my one-on-one clients right now, I would say half are in that sandwich generation where they are taking care of a child and they're taking care of an aging parent or one person is taking care of a sister as well, like an aging sister. And I also have clients that are taking care of spouses who have had some sort of acute issue. So, you know, an acute accident, a traumatic brain injury, a stroke, and their entire life has shifted and and they don't know what to do. Everything is different. They've relied on this person. I have clients that have been dealing as a caregiver and suddenly their loved one has passed away and they're dealing with the shift in life from my role and my responsibility and everything I knew was caring. And now that's gone. And so they're grieving their loved one and starting this new life that they don't know. So it's a huge variety of people. We have all sorts of diagnoses that people are caring for. And yeah, it's there's such a big spectrum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was doing my master's degree, we were caring for my grandparents. And I remember that there was this time where, you know, one was in the hospital and the other other was out and then the other was in and the other was out. And there was this sort of juggling act. And then this really important organization of care at home, because we were also at the point where we had round the clock care and sometimes several time one for each. And I remember that one of my grandparents was actually in the ICU for a time. And I, because I have a background in healthcare and actually now at my law firm, I help patients and families advocate for themselves within institutions as as a lawyer. So before anything wrong happens, I like to mitigate circumstances and help people come out on the other side without without harm, really, without without the need for a lawsuit. (laughs) That's the goal. For, for, for with, with, with that part of my practice. And so anyway, while I was doing my master's degree and, and my grandparents were sort of in and out, it was really important to me that they weren't in the hospital alone. So for me, either I was there or one of my parents was there and 
it was a ton of juggling. And thankfully, I had some flexibility in my schedule because I was writing my thesis at that point. And so I was able to sort of work anywhere there was Wi-Fi. And so I remember I wrote like a vast majority of my thesis in the ICU. And there was this really sort of, you know, there's a lot of tension in, in doing that because on the one side, you have to think critically. And on the other side, you're sitting with somebody who you care so much about, watching the numbers, watching, making sure that the right medication is coming or that the right person is coming and that they're doing the right thing. And so your mind is really in like a hundred different places all at the right time. And so for other students maybe who are or are maybe or have been in this sort of circumstance what do you what do you have to say to that what are and maybe you can also shed some light based on your experience doing your masters caring for somebody because i think that there's so much alignment there yeah so i think you're right it will help to share my story and relate that way and then i can say some things i did and also some things that i think might be helpful in that situation so Yes, when I was in my master's, doing my master's degree, I was living at home with my parents and my mom was unwell. And at the same time, my my grandmother was deteriorating. She was declining and she was also in the hospital. And so I have many memories sitting by her bedside doing my final year's papers while she was lying in a coma while I was managing her care. And I know exactly what that can feel like. It's it's awful. It's this run of adrenaline where you're going from one place and then you're kind of catching your breath for five seconds and then you're running to the other place and you need to maintain your mental composure so you can be there to support other people while also trying to have the mental drive to put your work into your school. Like it's it's something you can't really explain to other people. And you're in this fight or flight mode. And then obviously that can't last forever. So one day when that, whatever happens, whether that ends or you have a day where you just wake up and you're just like, I cannot do this anymore, or you burn out or everything just comes up because you can only repress something for so long. So when I was in that situation, I had already established pretty good boundaries, but that would be my number one thing is boundaries. I had to be very honest with other people in saying, this is what's happening in my life. And I'm not saying this is an easy thing to do. It took me a lot of time to develop, but I, this is what's happening in my life. I'm just going to let you know so that if you don't hear from me, you know that I'm not ignoring you. I'm not, because otherwise people will kind of say, well, where'd you go? Or they'll keep calling you or they're worried about you. And you can't take care of those calls in these moments. So communicating, even just like a general text that you can copy and paste to people so that you don't have to call everyone because we know all know how much time that takes to say, this is what's happening in my life. You know, someone in my family's not well, if you don't want to go into it or my grandparents not well or my mom or whoever. I'm going from school to here to here. I love you. I just have to let you know that right now I may not be able to support you or I may not be able to speak. And if you call me and I don't answer, I'll do my best to reply whenever I can. That will give you the freedom to shut off. You know, if you need to turn your phone off, which I had to do a lot because I couldn't be all immersed in everything at the same time. That is too much for us on a daily basis, let alone while we're caring for someone. That allows you the freedom to just say, I'm going to unplug. They know what's happening. I'm going to hope they understand, but they also know what's going on with you. And so they may give you grace. You don't owe them as much in that moment in terms of your friendships or your relationships. So the number one thing I would say, A, is boundaries, communicating. The second thing is lean on other people for support. So even if you're a person that does not like to talk about things, even if you're a person that is more introverted and you gain energy from being by yourself, have at least one person that you talk to. You might have to force yourself to speak to that person, but keeping everything inside of you, it's when you're dealing with so much, you have to express. Otherwise, you're again, you're going to burn out. You're going to internally just be in such a bad place and you need all the support you can and all the energy you can. And it doesn't mean you have to go into detail about what's happening, but if you have one person that you can just say, let's go for coffee and talk about something different. 
doesn't even have to be what's going on. Make sure you have some sort of a social aspect, someone that you can express yourself to. That's really important in this time because it will make you feel supported and it will give you that energy. Even if you don't feel like talking to them, you'll probably feel a million times better after you see them. Or they can talk about something funny that happened in their life. And having that distance and that space from whatever you're doing for half an hour, for an hour, will also give you that separation and that ability to just detach because that's so important when you're in that moment all the time. I would also say that it's really important for you to take some time for yourself. And I know people can laugh at this and say, how do I have time for myself? I'm in school. I'm taking care of someone. I'm in the hospital. But you have to. So if there was going to be a third thing I would say is that term that everyone uses, and I wish there was a different term, self-care. I know it's repeated over and over again, but do something for yourself and schedule it in. Because if you have it on your calendar and you know it's there, you're going to do it. If you keep telling yourself, sure, I'm going to go for a walk. I'll do it tomorrow. You're not going to remember. Or when that comes up time, you'll say, oh, but I have a million other things to do. Put it in your calendar, three o'clock on Wednesdays and Fridays. I go for a half an hour walk in that beautiful forest near the, nearby. There's some hospitals that have great forests nearby or there's hospitals with great walking spaces. So those would be my top three things. And that's just gonna keep you going and get you through everything until you get to the other side. Yes, because there is another side, right? Like this is, yes. this is there is a phase. It doesn't seem like it in the moment. But everything, mm-hmm. everything is a phase and, and all things come to an end in terms of, in terms of the intensity of situations. Yeah. And there, there are ebbs and flows as well. In yeah. terms of self-care, I totally agree with you. And I have our, one of our podcast episodes actually unpacks the idea of self-care. Mm-hmm. And instead I sort of reframe it to, to think about self-care as self-preservation, self-restoration and, mm-hmm. and Yep. doing things that are productive and restorative. So not sure. blindly scrolling, but as you suggest, taking a walk, unplugging, just socializing with somebody who you actually enjoy socializing with. Don't force yourself yeah. to socialize with somebody who exhausts yeah, you. Exactly. I think, and I think you made another really great point, which was energy management. And I, I'm sort of reading between the lines here, but I think that what is one of the things that is so important And this, I think, is a thread that weaves through everything that you've said in terms of boundaries, in terms of taking some time for yourself, in terms of leaning on other people. This is all contributing to how you manage your energy because you cannot be at 100%, 100% of the time. And you need to be able to preserve energy for, for yourself. And you need to be able to take a step back. And like you said, this is not easy. This is not easy. And when I was going through it, I would have said, like, this is impossible. There's no way to do this. Having said that, I remember that during that time, there were like two or three gym gym classes a week that were, you know, 45 or 50 minutes each that I religiously went to. And I would look forward to them. And I also didn't, I also made it a priority to, to batch, batch prepare meals. So I wasn't getting, you know, takeout and spending all that money on like hospital, cafeteria, you know, food all the time. And so I think that there are these ways that we can manage not only our energy, but also our commitments, our responsibilities, but it takes energy management in order to do that. Yeah. I would also say, you know, if you're, if you are going through a program or you're in school, I reached out to my professors oh, yes. and I just let them know. This is what's happening with me right now. One of them was not understanding at all. I I do remember that. And I was very upset, but most of them were. Just to say, this is what's happening right now. I can still write my assignments. I'm not trying to get an out here. But what I want to tell you is that this is what's going on. My work may not be at its best, but just having them respond with understanding. Some of them gave me grace in terms of timeline so that I could focus on my grandmother or my mom. One of them I remember said, it doesn't matter, like that you have to turn it in. That's what it is. And that's fine. I did. But just expressing that because we're all going through something and they might be more understanding than you think. And especially if you express the situation and, and what's unfolding for you, they're probably going to be met with, you know, 
an empathetic space or a space where they're giving you grace and and allowing you that freedom to take care of yourself. So I would try that avenue. A lot of people are scared and say, well, I don't want to look weak or I feel like I'm using this as an excuse. But if you're really in that situation, it's not an excuse. This is a hard time. Okay. You're not just going there and saying, oh, you know, I'm upset because my flight was delayed and I was supposed to go away and now I'm sad. So I'm just going to sit at home. That's not what you're saying. You're saying I'm here taking care of someone and I'm trying to finish up my degree or I'm trying to do this important paper and I don't have the capacity. And so for sure, you know, exploring that option too. I totally agree with you. And I think that's such an important point. And this is actually something that I raised in a previous episode on exam time strategies, which is reach out to your professors. Reach out. I'm currently a professor. I have been teaching at York now for 12 years, over 12 years. And something that I say to my students is if you have extenuating circumstances, just send an email. Just send an email. You don't need to ask for anything, but if it, if it helps you to feel heard and just to know that I know what's going on. And I do give grace. I do give grace. And, and it just, even if the students don't use the grace, it's there. And granted, as you've said, a lot of like some professors don't provide that and don't provide the understanding. Having said that, if a professor, you know, professors are regular people, just like anyone. And if they've been in a situation where they've had to care and deal with the dynamics of caring, they're probably going to be pretty understanding. And that doesn't mean that they're going to give you all kinds of extensions because there there are, you know, administrative forms and like all kinds of stuff that needs to happen for actual, you know, deferrals or, or you know, longer extensions. But there there is a certain amount of leeway that that a professor has in a course, if I'm being frank. And whether they choose to exercise that or not is up to them. But I personally have always been understanding because I've been there. I've been there. And even if I hadn't been there, somebody's coming to you with a problem, with even just opening up, even just being receptive to something that I ha- maybe I haven't experienced, but I know that they are. Just being receptive can mean the world to someone. So I totally agree with yeah. you there. And it's it's funny because you don't know what connection you'll have with your professors either, mm-hmm. right? In my undergraduate career while I was there, in my fourth year was when my mom was very unwell and we were trying to figure out a lot of things. I was in a very bad place. And I remember reaching out to one of my professors. I did not ask him for an extension on anything. I did not ask him for any sort of anything. All I said was, I just want you to know what I'm going through right now, because I know you can see me every day in your class. It was a very small class. I said, I know you can see me every day. I want to be on. I want to be myself. This means a lot to me and it's important, but this is what's happening in my life. And I am really struggling right now. And I felt such a connection to him. It was like, I never thought I would have this sort of connection to my professor, but his reply was so genuine and so loving. And the next time I came into class, we just made eye contact with each other and it gave me such a feeling of understanding and this space that allowed me to be myself, it made all the difference. Nothing changed. I didn't have an extension, but I just felt like he got it. And he didn't need to tell me why he got it. It was just, he got it. And that made all the difference to me. I will never forget that. It was such a life-changing moment in that year. Yes. Because nobody knew what I was experiencing, but I opened up to him. And so if you can open up, I I would definitely suggest it. Yeah. Especially over the last few years where we haven't been in person, it's even more. I, at the beginning of every single one of my classes, I always, always leave the door open to say, you can email me confidentially. If you're, if you'd like you know, a detailed response, ask for one. If you're not looking for a response and you just want me to know what's going on, send it along, whatever. This is a confidential space, it's a safe space and you can feel free to do that. And 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 I'm so happy that they do. My students do. Yeah. I've done this for 12 years. So I think I also have a bit of a reputation for doing that. <laughs> thousands and thousands of students over that time. But I think that that's really helpful advice. So thank you for raising that. I appreciate that. And when it comes to dealing with the 
dynamics between family and caregivers, caregivers and caregivers, because sometimes, as you know, students, whether they're, you know, in their early 20s, whether they're mature students who are coming back, find themselves in situations where they are managing people, managing care. And it is such an important, it's such an important act to be managing that care because these are, you're, you're, what you're doing is managing the dynamics between people who are caring for your loved one, who are actually spending time with them. And you want the caregivers to be happy. You want them to feel appreciated. You want them to feel fulfilled in their role. Caregiving is hard work. It's hard work. If you've ever been around it, it's, and I know that you have, but for anybody listening, if you've ever been around it, it is hard, emotional, physical work that is for so many reasons, precarious, underpaid, and undervalued in our society. And so as a family member who's managing that, having that understanding to begin with, I think is really helpful. But also the, can you maybe speak to managing dynamics? And and I know that you've had a recent experience that you've shared on Instagram. So perhaps you'll draw on that, but feel free to draw on any of your sure. experience. Yeah. So when hiring care providers, you know, whether that's somebody that's coming to your home or if your loved one is in a facility and you're paying extra for a care provider to come in there, you're going to be dealing with some sort of care provider or in the hospital. And that dynamic in and of itself is a whole other thing to manage. So not only are you managing the care of your loved one, but now you have to manage everybody else. And whether that's you're the employer and you're taking over that responsibility or you're dealing with conflict with caregivers. So I'm going to give an example. And this was the example I shared on Instagram. I've had many situations, but this specific one, my mom has three different hired care providers who come in and the three of them had an argument that had absolutely nothing to do with my mom and absolutely nothing to do with my dad, which happens because it's a very high intensity environment. As you said, right? It's very labor intensive. It's very stressful. It can be very underpaid depending if you're coming from an agency or whatever's going on. Care providers work around the clock. That's the nature of their work. They need the financial gain to do whatever they need to do to support their family. And that's what they do. So I think two of them were quite burnt out. And one of them was unfortunately caught in the line of fire. They had a very heated argument and told my father, who lives with my mom, that they were not going to come back because they didn't want to see each other. And that was it. And my dad needs these people. These people have been working with my dad for something like seven, eight years. They know my mom very well. My mom identifies with them. She may not know their names, but she knows them. She's comfortable with them. So to find a whole new person is not just about sourcing somebody that's good. It's sourcing someone that my mom is familiar with. She's not going to hide from. She's not going to be combative with. It's so much more than that. And that was a horrible situation for my dad because he said, what am I going to do this by myself? My dad is almost 80. He cannot manage my mom by himself. And my mom needs a lot of care. And that meant that I would have to go and care for her. And I have three kids under the age of five. So that wasn't an option either. So when managing these dynamics, at first, you know, my dad didn't handle it very well. He's a you know, that's just his personality. And he will admit that he didn't handle it well. He yelled and he criticized and that's his go-to. And that's a lot of people's go-to is anger and frustration. And what do you mean you can't come back? I need you. And of course, that's what you're going to say, because you're in the situation that feels like the entire world is falling on you. You have this thing going, especially if you're a student in school, right? You rely on these care providers to help you while you're doing everything else. And then suddenly one day they're not coming back. How are you going to finish your thesis? How are you going to finish your degree? What are you going to do? These are people you need. So I said, dad, okay, you're not, that's not the best approach just because you're pushing these people even further. They're already angry. You're going to make them even more angry. They're not answering the phone now because you're screaming at them. So 
I tend to come from a place of more empathy and understanding just the nature of who I am and also the work I do. So I called all three parties and listened to them. They all had valid points and then gave them that space and that energy. I then connected the three of them to talk. And then eventually the agreement was come from my mom. If you don't like each other, that's fine. You don't have to talk to each other, but come from my mom because my mom is not the one that did anything to you. And so approaching it from as, and this is also a very difficult thing, a place of understanding, a place, a place of trying to be patient and trying to give them that space can be all you need for them to stay and fix the situation because I understand the want to yell and I understand the frustration and that immediate reaction, but that's just going to cause them to retreat even more. And this is not a situation where you want to go and hire new people. It is so hard to hire people. If it has to happen, it has to happen. I've had many clients in that situation where the person, the caretaker just left and they had to hire someone. They made it work. You know, there are backup agencies that you can call. You can pay hourly until you find that one person. There are respite options. But if you don't need it to happen, then approaching it from a place of support and just listening can make all the difference and seeing how you can make things work if it's not working out. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great point. You know, coming at it from a place of understanding, leaving space, giving them the energy and also the validation that yeah. that the way that they feel is valid in this circumstance because it very yes. well may be. Yes. I I didn't there were there was one person I didn't validate sure. that much because I didn't believe in it. Fair and enough. I didn't really agree with what they were saying. But, but yes, if there's this space to validate, absolutely. I mean there was somebody else that I did validate So absolutely, it's important for them to feel heard because this is a management relationship. I'm not their employer. My dad is, but I'm still involved in managing what's going on there, especially in this circumstance. So if you think about it and you've had a manager at work or you're a manager to somebody else and they're coming to you with an issue, right? If my manager yelled at me and told me, you know, how could you do this? Whatever. I'd probably go out the door. But if they're sitting with me and saying, okay, let me listen to your concerns. Let's make it right. I'm much more likely to stay. And so, and that's what happened in this situation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what is a piece of advice that you would give a student or a mature student or somebody who's working on their own advancement? They may be professionals, young professionals who are working on their own advancement and also caring at the same time. Allowing yourself to feel all of the emotions is a big piece because it's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel upset. Identify what you're going through and know that this is hard and allow yourself to feel. That's really, really important. Not ignoring what's going on. Taking that time to try and create balance is important too. And doing those three things that I suggested earlier But if you're really struggling and you are feeling really overwhelmed, you're not sleeping, you're crying all the time, you're feeling insanely anxious, you can't focus, it might be time to seek professional support. And I have to say that, of course, not only because I'm a a psychotherapist, but there, it does come to a point where you do need that help to get out or to incorporate those strategies. And if just trying to incorporate isn't working, you may need that extra step. But having that support person weekly or bi-weekly or whatever it may be to talk to and look forward to and implement those strategies and hold you accountable because when we're so stressed in our lives, it's hard to keep ourselves accountable to doing all of these self-care things and all of these boundary things and all of these balance things, right? So just having someone that you know you're going to see and you're like, oh shoot, I told them I was going to create that boundary today and I didn't do it. I better get on that so I can tell them that I did that, right? It really makes a difference. And I know that a lot of programs offer free support options or they offer supplemented support options or they can connect you with somebody. But even if you see somebody not through the program, that's really a very important piece if you're feeling like you're not coping. I think that's great advice. And I think that it's, I think this all goes back to our discussion earlier about energy management, seeking out support for yourself is one strategy 
that will provide you with lots of other strategies for yeah. managing your your energy and your ultimately your time and your ability and your capacity to continue to do the things that are important to you, including your own advancement and caring for loved ones or whoever it is you're caring for. And we also may have some listeners who are caregivers themselves. So I think that this is also great advice for them too. Yeah. Taking care of your mental health is not just about taking care of your mental health. It's not just about saying, oh, I'm anxious or I'm depressed or I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that and I'm going to get help. It's also about whatever else is going on in your life, your relationships with other people, how you're engaging with people, what's going on in your school, what's going on in your work. It impacts everything. And it can make all the difference in every aspect of your life because the way that you think and the way that you approach things is the way that everything else is going to go. So it's that beginning piece to everything. And I think everybody needs mental health support at one time or another. Life is hard to everybody at some point. And it's okay to need that support. It's not forever. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. But It can just be that thing that helps you cruise, right? Or it keeps you stationary. I like to think of a boat in the water. And if you're not taking care of yourself and you're really not in a good place, your boat is just flying around and you get that anchor and you throw it in the water and suddenly your boat is anchored in place. You're still on a boat floating in the water. Like you're not on land, but at least you're in a place where while you're in that water, you're stationary. And while you're in that chaos, at least you can take a deep breath and try and figure it out. It's not the perfect place. You're not on the land walking around, but you're somewhere. You're not just floating around. And so it can make all the difference in that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a great analogy. I think that's a great analogy. And so finally, what is the one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? How old is my younger self? However old you want them to be. (laughs) I would tell myself that it's okay to put myself first. It's okay to take my care of myself before taking care of other people. Because if I don't take care of myself, I can't give to other people. And it took me a long time to realize that. And it took me a long time to identify that if I am no good for myself and I don't care for myself, ultimately, I can't care for other people. You're right about that. You are so right about that. And that's something that people may learn at one time in their life. Some people don't learn that or they know that they should be doing it and then they never do. I think that this is such an important piece of advice because if we don't preserve ourselves, if we don't allow ourselves to, if we don't allow ourselves to be the best that we can be and spend that effort on ourselves, we cannot be there for others in the way that we want to be. So thank you for that. So where can people reach you if they want to reach out? So I'm the most active on my Instagram account, which is at Compassion in Caregiving, or they can visit my website, CompassionInCaregiving.com and reach out. You can schedule a call with me or just send me an email at Stephanie at CompassionInCaregiving.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode leave this episode a review and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.